Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us at 8 o'clock in the morning for our book talk with Franklin Fower. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of quick housekeeping notes. Um, as you're finishing your breakfast, feel free to float uh, into the seats. And without further ado, we are going to get started. We are here to talk, Frank, about your book, World Without Mind. Um, it's not a book that throws any soft punches right <laughs> out of the bat. It kind of acknowledges all the lovely things that tech has done for us, all the convenience it's, it brings us, but basically asserts that tech, um, most notably Apple, Google, Facebook, Amazon, um, they're on a crusade to mold humanity into their desired image of it, as you say. Um, that comes with a lot of crazy kind of threats to privacy, to individualism, to Free markets. Um, which of these should be mo which, which of these should we be most afraid of? <laughs> so I think anybody who has a phone understands uh, the power of big tech because I know that when I want to get a good night's sleep, I have to put my phone in the basement because otherwise <laughs> I'm going to wake up in the middle of the night and I'm just going to end up automatically in this zombie-like state, grasp for my phone, and I'll get stuck in an endless scroll and I'll wake up the next morning kind of not remembering what I actually looked at and my circadian rhythms will be, be disrupted. And that's not an accident. Um, our phones and these platforms have been engineered to seize our attention. Um, they take data, which is this cartography of our psyche. They have this kind of snapshot of our mind. They know the things that give us pleasure. They know the things that cause us anxiety. And they take that information in order to keep us on their products for as long as possible. And that comes at a cost. It comes at a cost for us as individuals. And I think and, you know, we know this when we're um, having conversations with people we care about and the ways in which uh, our devices get in the way of our ability to connect and to actually be present for the people um, we're in, we, we, we love and we're in conversation with. Um, it, uh, when you're being distracted and notified all the time, it makes it harder to, to, to be a spiritual person, to contemplate the important things in the world because your, your attention is always being steered in some other direction by, by someone else. Um, and then it comes at cost for our society and our democracy that um, we've seen it in the ways in which Google and Facebook have amassed these massive online advertising monopolies that have come at the expense of our profession. And uh, media has paid a heavy price, especially at the local level. But it, in this other sort of subtle way, um, all of media has become dependent on these platforms. So Facebook's, uh, Facebook is responsible for a huge amount of traffic uh, that goes to media. And so Facebook's rules, the things that succeed on Facebook, end up getting transmitted to the rest of the profession. Our dependence on Facebook means that Facebook's values end up becoming our values, and it's, and it's highly distorting for the, the, for the profession. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your time at the New Republic. It's not a thing that you shied away from. You, you kind of grasped up front, grappled with up front, um, you know, your challenging time here, there and the fact that, you know, technology and the pressure to um, adhere to things like Facebook and social media were, were part of the dissolution of your time there. Talk about how that played into your thinking about the book. Right. So um, New Republic, I was the editor of the New Republic magazine, which uh, was this a uh, little magazine based in Washington. Um, we never had a really big circulation. Um, I read a history of the 1960s once that described how the entire readership of the New Republic wouldn't fill the University of Mississippi football stadium. Um, and we were a magazine that, uh, that elevated contrarianism to almost kind of theological conviction, sometimes to a fault. Um, but this idea was that if something was if something was conventional wisdom, it wasn't, it wasn't gonna make it into our pages. And then we really struggled with the transition to the digital era, because um, blogging was opinion and opinion was what we did and suddenly we faced all this competition and we couldn't really figure out how to find our place in that new world. And I'd been editor and it meant that we were constantly searching for new owners and I got exhausted with that, and I stepped down as owner and as editor in 2010. Uh, yeah, it's probably a, an interesting Freudian conflation there I just made. Um, 
<laughs> and then in 2012, a couple years later, uh, we had this white knight who walked in, this mystical savior whose name was Chris Hughes, and he was 28 years old, and he was worth $700 million. Yeah, you hate him already. Um, and, uh, and, and, and he professed to be idealistic and earnest, and he was all those things, and he kind of represented this hope that journalism could find a dignified way to transition into the social media era. And it worked out great until he rightly started asking questions about our revenue, and, um, and he started to panic about our business model. And he said, I know how to fix this. It's not gonna be through selling advertising, because I don't like doing that. It's gonna be through social media, because I invented it, and I know the tricks. And so we made this really quick transition where we've been a magazine that had rejected conventional wisdom to being a magazine that was, that was embracing the values of Facebook, which are all about in, you know, the thing that is trending and trying to use data and use our understanding of the weaknesses of readers in order to try to gin up um, articles that they'll click on. And it felt like this, this huge shock to our system and things ultimately ended up going really badly. <laughs> <laughs> the graceful transition wasn't so yeah. graceful. Yeah. Um, talk about the dissonance. And one of the most interesting parts of the book to me was this theory that like, there's a big dissonance between the values of these big companies as far as um, valuing individualism and single users agencies and the connectivities of social networks um, and the place that they kind of take up as a monopoly and, and kind of making, removing that agency and kind of making choices for us and automating the kind of little small choices we make every day. What, what tension were you trying to drive at there? Yeah, well, that's, I mean, do you think that that's precisely the kind of uh, almost diabolical irony at the heart of all of this. It's exactly right. It's that uh, social media and so much of the internet creates this illusion that we're in the driver's seat, um, that it's our choices, uh, yet that's not the case. Uh, it's not the case um, in ways that we know. It's like if, you know, the thing that Google decides to put at the top of its search results is the thing that we're most likely to click on. And that's an incredible amount of power that Google has invested in itself. We know that uh, the search, that, that your newsfeed on Facebook is not just your friends sharing things, it's an algorithm that's sorting a massive amount of news and information in order to keep you engaged as long as possible. And so there is this invisible power that lurks. Uh, and, and what's so, um, What's so terrible about it is that it is that 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 is the personalized part of it. That they are exploiting uh, the weaknesses of the individual. But one of the paradoxes, I think, is the ways in which it actually ends up inadvertently driving us in a conformist sort of direction. Um, and I described this a little bit in the ways in which uh, Facebook has reshaped media. Um, so I'll give you an example. Um, there was. Uh, there was a lion, a celebrity lion, um, called Cecil, like the Kim Kardashian of lions, um, who was killed by a Minnesota hunter. And the Minnesota hunter posted a photo uh, of the corpse of Cecil the lion, and the internet was totally outraged, you know, rightly so, over the killing of Cecil the lion. And as media could see that outrage starting to grow, because we have access to all these tools and analytics that allow us to see the, how the ecosystem works in real time, everybody begins to try to scrape some of the popularity from that thing that is trending. And so um, if you're a high-minded magazine like The Atlantic or The New Yorker or you're the, the Washington Post or The New York Times or Us Weekly or whatever, it does not matter. You're all gravitating towards the same topic of conversation, whether or not you actually think it's worthy because you're trying to succeed in this Facebook Universe, And in the end, there were 3.2 million stories written about Cecil the Lion. Well, I'm wondering if there's some level of, of personal responsibility, you know, baked into that, right? That the algorithms might be, according to you, trying to steer us all in one singular direction that to, to get rid of, you know, individualism and all of these things. But is there something that, that a person can be responsible for doing for themselves to combat that, right? We talk a lot about Twitter and echo chambers and trying not to um, allow yourself to exist in the bubble. Um, how much of that personal agency can combat some of these algorithmic 
things. So I think a lot about the way that we think about technology uh, tends to eat away at our sense of agency, that we, we're told that these things are inevitable, and so there's really nothing that we can do about it. But there's, a par there's an analogy that I, I take some hope in, which is that if you look at uh, the way the development of food, that like, uh, 60 years ago, there was this revolution in food where we suddenly had access to uh, TV dinners and processed foods, and we scoff at that now, but it was an incredible thing at the time because of the convenience and the price. There were no more pots and pans to clean up. You didn't have to go to the store every day. I guess people thought it tasted good. Um, and then you wake up many decades later and you say, holy crap, this stuff was reverse engineered in order to addict us. It remade our palates. It remade the whole economy of food production. It, it, and we paid a terrible price with both our, uh, both our waistlines and the damage to our planet. And you know, it, it, there's a similar sort of way in which that's happening to the things that we ingest through our minds, where there's so much of the same sort of reverse engineering where we're trying, where, where there's so much that these big tech companies do that tries to kind of rewire our brains to try to tap into a lot of our worst instincts. And that sounds bad, except that belatedly, we be, you know, there's at least at some level, society began to wake up to the realization of what happened with food. And we began to make, uh, you know, there, there was this real focus on making more virtuous choices where we would reject the thing that is most convenient or cheapest um, in order to do the thing that was kind of healthiest, not just for us, but for the whole uh, uh, chain of, of production. I think we're in a similar moment for technology, right? I think that there's a growing skepticism toward big technology companies and the motives of the people who run these companies. Where do you think that started? Is it is it an example like Edward Snowden? Is it an example like the election of Donald Trump? Is it something much earlier than that? What, when do you think the tide started to turn where people started to become more critical of their relationship with technology? Yeah. Uh, with the publication of my book, of course. Uh, <laughs> I think that the election of Donald Trump was an event that rumbled society to its core. And in my book, I write about how with privacy, with I mean, there's just all that we've been so inattentive and so unfocused on the ways in which we've left ourselves vulnerable. And I wrote that there was going to be a bit, there's going to be a moment where we're hit by uh, what I call the big one, which was a hack that would rumble society to its core and that we would we would wake up to a lot of the stuff. And you could argue that that the hacking of our election is a pretty big thing. Um, and I think that the election of Donald Trump did a couple things. One is, I think it created anxiety more broadly about the information that's consumed by our citizens and uh, created an awareness of the filter bubbles in which we exist. I think it, it, with Facebook and the Cambridge Analytica scandal, we started to see the ways in which there was this extreme carelessness with our data. And I think that there was just a lot, there was actually a lot of pent up uh, rage <laughs> that people felt towards these companies, especially in media. It's like the New York Times was like pounding Silicon Valley day after day for a stretch last year. And um, you have to think like what, that, 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 that anger was lurking there, but suddenly it became kind of acceptable to express it after the election of Donald Trump. Um, and most importantly, it's we see uh, people turning away from some of these platforms that it, I'm not sure exactly what's happening with Facebook and why it hit this stall. Um, I think that to some extent they've just kind of uh, plateaued. There's, there's, it's hard for them to achieve further growth. But when you look at um, the discontent among kind of the co-founders of Instagram or WhatsApp, uh, the, their, their primary um, uh, some of the primary thinkers, you look at the ways in which usership is, is starting to stall on the platform, you have to wonder whether um, there is a mass backlash that's materialized. Well, I'm really interested in kind of taking a step back and, and looking at this in some more historical context, right? There's um, Facebook and Google and all these people who are controlling, you know, the flow of information throughout the world and through these networks. Um, but information has always existed and to the extent that that's true, there's always been people there to control and manipulate it, to act as gatekeepers. What's different about this moment and the manifestation of the rage that you just expressed? 
Yeah, why, why we at The Atlantic are gatekeepers, <laughs> right? I mean, we, yeah. we, we uh, and I don't think that there's anything wrong with the, the you know, gatekeeping is an, is an important part of the functioning of democracy, that there's just so much information to be had, um, so much of it's bad, um, and you have to have people who make choices about what's important and what's not important because the average citizen doesn't have the time to do that for themselves. Uh, and so what's, what's different about these companies? And I, I'd say that there are a couple things. One is um, just the sheer size and scope of them. Um, you know, and it's not just that uh, whatever it is, like something like 70% of us use Google as our primary um, means for searching for information or that you know, more than 50% of Americans have used Facebook as a primary means of getting news. You look at these companies, look at something like Google. Google began with the very humble ambition of organizing the world's knowledge, and that's not enough. And so now um, they've expanded in all these ways, shapes, and forms where you know, it's your, your, all your private information, your emails, your calendars, this data resides within a Google system that Google is building um, uh, building self-driving cars. Google has a life sciences company that wants to beat death. Um, or you take Amazon, which uh, started off as a bookstore, then became the everything store, and now powers the cloud. It is one of the biggest TV and movie, movie studios in, in the world. Um, its owner owns the Washington Post. Um, and you know, it's one of the biggest contractors with the Pentagon, you know, so on and so forth. There's no place where these companies begin and these companies end. Um, well, to that end, it sounds kind of like an unstoppable force almost, right? It seems to me like the main takeaway from your book is that we should take a moment and just think about all the ways that these companies and, and tech broadly is kind of eroding the things that make us human, right? That's a big lofty kind of thing to tackle. Um, and you use examples of things that we can do as small as like reading a book on paper versus reading it electronically. I'm, I'm curious to say, how, how do you think these small kind of solutions attack what seems kind of like a gargantuan goal? So uh, in my view, tech rep big tech represents an economic problem because they've uh, achieved so much power over the way that our markets function. Um, Google and Amazon uh, are just so crucial to the ways that um, you know re the restaurant industry works, the retail business works, um, and so there are, there, are, there are political solutions to that. Um, you know, and you see right now this revival of antitrust, which had been uh, a sleepy, dormant backwater of the law that's that's suddenly coming roaring back, where you have everybody from. Elizabeth Warner, Warren to Donald Trump to the Democratic Party, all trying to elevate monopoly, anti-monopoly as a central uh, feature of their, their their analysis of political economy. But I do I, I I I'm glad you brought up the kind of the personal aspect of that, which is that I think that um, as individuals we need to look for the the seams and the spaces where we can um, tend to our human core, where we can focus on maintaining um, uh, kind of the sense of contemplation and privacy. And, and the book's example is, I think, a powerful one in that uh, when Jeff Bezos unveiled the Kindle in 2009, everybody predicted that hardcover books would disappear because it was just so incredibly easy and convenient to download a book. Um, Nicholas Negroponte, who, is the, who, run, who ran the MIT Media Lab, said by the year 2015, hardcover books would cease to exist. Well, you know, lo and behold, uh, <laughs> um, it's 2018. It's still here. Yeah, it's still here. And why is that? And I, don't, I think subconsciously, um, I think a lot of us made a decision to return to, to hardcover books. I was a big fan of the Kindle when it came out. I have like five Kindles sitting in my basement that I bought that are now, um, that I've never used, I haven't used or touched for the last couple years. And I think subconsciously, we end up gravitating to this space that is represented by the book. That in the history of reading, um, you know, reading was something that was a very, very public activity that uh, it was uh, literally a magical thing. You had priests 
reading the word of God to illiterate masses. You had storytellers going to, uh, to villages to, to read stories to illiterate publics. And then um, in the, the late Middle Ages, when reading started to become a private activity, everything changed. Um, we, we, we started to develop this sense of privacy. There was this proliferation of dangerous, uh, subversive, revolutionary ideas that culminated in the Enlightenment because we suddenly had this space where we weren't being dictated to, where we had the ability to, um, to conceive our own ideas. And so where do we read now? I mean, I'm not ashamed to admit I read in the bed, I read in the bathtub, um, I read in like the most private spaces in my, my home. And I think as we gravitate back to the paper book, we're actually engaged in this subconscious act of resistance where we're saying, I don't want somebody looking over my shoulder as I read. I don't want somebody notifying me and dinging and pinging me and trying to hijack my attention. I don't want to be umbilically connected to a corporate store. Um, I want to be in this, this space where um, I'm, I'm alone. Absolutely. Um, I want to transition quickly and selfishly to talk a little bit about your work with The Atlantic this year. You wrote two cover stories about some of the most um, newsy, important topics of this year, right? Paul Manafort uh, and ICE. Uh, I want to direct most of our attention to Manafort. Um, how did you identify, you, you talk about corruption being the master narrative of our times. How did you identify Paul Manafort um, as one of those key players among what seems like a sea um, of people that exemplify similar behavior? So one of the, one of the beautiful things about uh, journalism, one of the great things about The Atlantic is that you can, you know, when you see that you start to get, you, you see things, like you start to see little things, you remember things from, earlier in, in like your, your journalistic career. So I had remember, I, I'd gone to Ukraine after 2014 when there was the revolution that, that overthrew Viktor Yanukovych. And I remembered hearing stories about this American mastermind who'd been there. Um, I'd studied the history of American conservative, Washington conservatism, and I'd known about uh, uh, Jonas Savimbe and some of the other dictators that Paul Manafort had worked for, and I'd, I'd heard about his work there. And so I just had this, uh, you know, I, I, was, I was recalling, I was drawing on that database of reporting experiences, and uh, I just had this spidey sense that, uh, that this guy was kind of at the heart of something, and that even if he wasn't at the heart of collusion, that there was still a parable about the way that Washington functioned that could be told in the form of um, his biography. After your issue hit newsstands, or the, the issue where your cover story appears, um, you followed the trial. You, um, you know, have reported on Manafort continuously throughout the year. What more have you learned since the issue closed? So, um, you know, it was, I'd never, it was, it was actually an amazing thing for me because I'd spent so much time reporting on Paul Manafort, yet I'd never spent time in his presence. Uh, that I, I was, the way that I learned about him was mediated through uh, his business partners, his friends, through documents, through, through text messages, through, all, through Mueller's uh, uh, filings. But then it's just a different thing to actually see a person um, it's really one of the, um, it's one of the most journalistically useful things you can do is just to sit and, and watch someone. And so in, I got to sit and watch him during the trial. And, and um, uh, you know, even though I, I, it's not like I hadn't seen him before because, of course, he's all over YouTube. But just it's the little moments that uh, where you see him huddling with his lawyers, you see the way that he... Uh, touches other people, you see the way that he mugs for the jury. And as I was watching him, I, I felt like I was starting to understand this other side to him. Uh, the question was always like, why didn't he flip? Why did it take him so long to cut a deal with Robert Mueller? Because he obviously was guilty. He was obviously going to go to prison. Um, and my theory after watching him was that he actually thought he could win, that there was this um, this uh, bizarrely inflated sense of self-confidence that the guy projects. 
uh, and you see it in the court. And I watched him um, just treating the jury as if it was like the third congressional district in Michigan or as if it was the news media. And I saw him and I, and I felt like, my God, this guy thinks he can, he can do it. And then when he wasn't able to do it, I could also see how that was gonna crush his sense of self and that um, it, felt, it felt to me like uh, as, soon as, he was, as soon as he lost and as soon as he was sitting in that jail cell and he was staring at the abyss and he was thinking about what the rest of his life was gonna look like, uh, and he knew Donald Trump and he knew that Donald Trump could not be a reliable source of a pardon because there's nothing about Donald Trump that's hugely reliable. Uh, that he was going to cut a deal. I want to, before I take one question from the audience, talk about quickly about your other cover story about ICE. And it's great that you mentioned Donald Trump. Um, the piece kind of focuses on kind of this institutional expansion of the agency and, and kind of how detrimental decisions that are being made by the administration kind of trickle their way into this agency that was kind of relatively unknown or not necessarily in the public eye. When you think of um, big news events like family separation at the border and the Muslim ban and um, the challenges with DACA, those are, those are big things, but I also get the sense from reading your piece that there are these kind of smaller, um, less identifiable things that have gone on within the, the agency that also present a really big challenge. Talk a little bit about how you were thinking about that. So ICE was just something that was constantly in the news and it was being, it, it, it had become the, the symbol of a lot that was, everything that was wrong with Donald Trump's immigration policy. And in part, I knew that that was not the case, that, that, um, that ICE existed before Donald Trump, that ICE was accused of doing all sorts of brutal things before Donald Trump. And so it just seemed like there was this bureaucratic culture that was at, at the heart of everything. And it was worth trying to understand that. Um, because one of the, the aspects of um, immigration policy enforcement that I find um, just the most troubling is the ways in which it becomes so easy to, uh, to take the immigrant and to dehumanize them. Um, to act as if they're just a case number or just part of a, a kind of a faceless mob that's invading the country. And I think that and that's certainly the way that it's portrayed by a lot of conservatives. And so I, I wanted to understand the way that the system actually worked. What was, how, if you're an ICE agent, how do you think about your job? Um, how, do you, how, do you, how do you describe your own place in the world? How do you describe the moral decisions that you're forced to make on a, on a daily basis? Um, and that's kind of what drove me into just uh, to doing almost, um, I wanted to do a, a bureaucratic study. How does the apparatus work? Uh, we have time for one question from the audience. Right here in the corner. Good morning, my name is Jim Jarvis. Um, for those of you who don't recognize me, I'm an old white guy. Uh, um, uh, I think at some level we're all fearful of what's happening in big tech. And we live in a world now where, uh, you know, rather than we use, uh, we, find, we find opinions rather than form opinions, uh, we uh, are entering a world in which decisions are not only uh, unaccountable and opaque, but with AI fundamentally incomprehensible. What I hear your critique it mainly involving is uh, the ills of capital concentrations. But it seems to me that this evolution doesn't depend on capital concentration. It's much more fundamental than that. What would you suggest prescriptively we do about the circumstances we're in? So, uh, the, in, in my view, uh, plural is, I mean, the reason I focus on capital concentrations, which I don't think is the entire entirety of the problem, but it's, for me, at the core of it, which is that you want to live in a world where there's pluralism and competition. And part of the problem is, is that if Google does a bad job with my privacy, I really don't have much of an alternative to turn to. There should be a robust competition 
uh, to create products that do a better job of protecting privacy or do a better job of curating the world. Um, I'll, give you, <laughs> I'll give you an example of the one way in which Google fails. Um, I, I typed into Google uh, a, a few months ago the term, what is God? Like a, a fairly fundamental question. I wanted to see how Google would respond. And uh, it's, it's a pretty rich topic, right? Um, some of the best writing in our, civ in our, in our civilization addresses this, con this topic from St. Augustine to Maimonides to Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins. Um, and yet, uh, when I did that search, I got page after page of, of proselytizing evangelicals where on page three, I got to Billy Graham and he was the best theologian I'd found <laughs> in that search to that day, to that point. And there's just a carelessness that, where that comes with the way that they're curating that information. Why isn't there a search engine that's pushing them to do a better job of getting a, a, a deeper, richer uh, a set of results to such an obvious question? Um, it's got, so that's one thing. Is I think competition is important, and we need to be prodding that. The second is it is just gobsmacking that we, there is no law protecting our data. I mean, we don't, I'm not talking about GDPR, the, the European privacy regulations, which are um, a much more robust set of rules, but there, you know, your health data is protected, some of your financial data is protected, but there is no law on the books in, in our nation, in, in Washington, D.C., that protects your data. Um, that's something that needs to change, uh, you know, now. Um, and we're entering in this world where Everything is the internet. Everything is connected to the internet. And there are the most minimal uh, standards uh, when it comes to all these, you know, billions of devices that are now connected to the internet that have the potential to surveil us. Why aren't we demanding a measure of, of privacy uh, with all these things that we're uh, now sticking into our homes? Um, I think that our political culture needs to awaken now to these problems to begin to address them. Um, Google and Facebook, I think, understand that uh, the beast of government has been stirred and that they are going to try to beat congressmen and senators to the, to the legislative table. And so they're going to draft weak versions of privacy protections before uh, our legislators do. And so we'll get weak results. Frank will be around to sign his book, World Without Mind. Franklin Bower, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.